Associate Head of Department in the Department of Physics. It's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight for the inaugural, inaugural lecture to be given by David Collins, Professor of Physics and E-Science. Uh, as I'm the first person to speak, I have to just point out the emergency exit, one down here, two at the back. Should there be an alarm, please follow the emergency exit signs and assemble on those comes for the road. Also, I just want to pass on uh, Professor Michelle Doherty, our head of the department. She's not able to be here tonight, she's out of the country, but she asked me to send on her apologies to you. However, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm delighted to be here because it's, it's, it really is great to be part of a celebration of David's promotion. And that's what it is it's a celebration. And I think it's great that we have opportunities like this for David to bring together family friends, colleagues, and have this celebration of David's, David's promotion. So let me tell you a little bit about David. Some of you will know bits and pieces of this, some of you might know it all, some of you might know none of it. <laughs> uh, David was joined the member of the, the academic staff of the Department of Physics in, in 2007. Uh, but he has a longer association with Imperial than that. He did his undergraduate degree, in physics. In fact, he was saying just before we started that he sat approximately there in the very <laughs> lecture theatre for his undergraduate classes. And then he stayed here and went on to do a, a PhD in biology physics. Once he finished his PhD, he went on to work on a project called D0, which is based in Fermi Lab in Chicago. But he did that as part of the Imperial College team. He was still an employee of Imperial College. And in all of the postdoctoral positions that David has been in since his PhD until he took up the position of the academic member of staff, he's always been employed by Imperial College. And I think that is an amazing piece of dedication and commitment to Imperial College, <laughs> to the Department of Physics, and indeed to the, to the High Energy Physics Group. Uh, during his, his time, I think, uh, I think what we're going to hear most about tonight started around about 2000, 2001, when he joined the CMS project and started working on the distributed computing uh, that uh, was a main part of, of, of that, and indeed what became the, the LHC uh, uh, <coughs> grid computing and the, the UK grid PP that he leads, that he's involved in. And he's led the e-science activity at Imperial since then. Hand in hand with the, uh, with the computing, uh, David was there right at the start of the Large Hadron Collider taking data, and uh, he's worked for more than 10 years on the Higgs boson. And it's that physics and that innovative computing that we're going to hear about a little bit later tonight. But let me tell you a little bit more about David away from, from his research. Uh, he's, a, he's, he's a very responsible person. He takes everything he does very he's seriously. Responsible, he's responsible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Peter's not sure. <laughs> Uh, and he takes his teaching very seriously. He's done all kinds of different teaching in the department. He's done uh, computing labs. He's taught advanced particle physics. Uh, he's done small group tutorials. Uh, he's... Uh, sorry. And uh, a few years ago, he also was asked to, to lead a review of our teaching in computing, which led us to move from C++ to, to Python. And uh, more recently, he's been involved in the second year lab project, uh, uh, leading the redesign of an interferometry experiment. And this exp interferometry experiment is done by about half of the students that go through our undergraduate program. And the computing is done by all of our students go that go through our undergraduate program. So this has had a big, wide-reaching impact on the number of on a, a wide number of students in, in the department. Uh, he's also contributed to the department in... In, in other ways, and I must admit that we, we do kind of take advantage of his e-science side of things, and he's chaired our physics uh, computing committee for a number of years, uh, and when recently we started the plans to refurbish our undergraduate uh, student suite, computer suite, he was uh, a key in determining the direction of travel of that project. And he also is a very important liaison person between the department and ICT, Central Computing. He speaks their language so he can, can tell them what we need and make sure that our academic and uh, research requirements are clearly understood. 
we're very fortunate to have you contribute to all of those things, David, so thank you very much in, indeed. Uh, I also believe that uh, David has studied uh, politics, philosophy, and history. Yeah, there's a lot of that going on just now. <laughs> and uh, I think in times to come, it might be interesting to look back, whatever happens this week, to look back and think, uh, think about the politics, put it into a historical perspective, and say, that was the week when David gave his inaugural lecture. <laughs> So, that's all very important, but that's not the main purpose of this evening. The main purpose is to hear from David. So I now invite David to come and give his inaugural lecture. The Higgs, what is it good for? Okay, thank you everybody. So, this, this is the lecture. The Higgs, what is it good for? So the first thing is, Unlike war, I mean to, mean to uh, persuade you that it's not absolutely nothing. <laughs> so, let's get the stress out of it. So, because the Higgs mechanism and, and the reason for its invention all happened before I was born, um, at some point, there's a, there's the only way I can start this was with a brief history of particle physics. And if you're doing a brief history of something, it's difficult to know where to start. So I looked and I thought a bit, and I thought it'd be better to, to give something that started relatively early and picked out pieces rather than try and, try and put everything together. So that's, that's what I've done. So we've started at the beginning, the beginning of the 19th century. What do we know? We knew there, were, there was matter, solids, liquids, and gases. We knew that air could be pumped out to form a vacuum. Um, we understood Newtonian mechanics. And, we, and we, we've sort of controlled everything that we, we observed. We knew about the solar system. So we've, got, we've, got, we've got Newton here. Does this work? Yes, but you can't see it. Okay, we've got Newton here. Not only a great physicist, but great hairstyle. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's something we can all aspire to. Um, and uh, and w there were people performing experiments um, and trying to understand what, what, what became known as electromagnetism. So the state of the world was, was pretty good. So the first bit of kind of like particle physics that I could find was around about 1804. Well, it wasn't around about 1804. It was 1804. Um, John Dalton uh, published a paper in, it's in a Manchester um, journal on the absorption of gases by water and other liquids. And, and this is the first time, really, in the modern era that, that the people um, suggested that matter is made of particles. So these, these are a couple of diagrams from that, from that paper. And you can see just about to see the dot, you can see that um, you, he really has thought about this and he, has, he, he views them as being real. So the, this isn't just a concept for him, he, he views them very much as being real. So these are supposed to be water molecules stacked and these are how gases can, can inter interpolate between, um, between other, other atoms, sorry, not molecules, atoms. You want to think of molecules in this. So that's 1804. So that, that's the beginning of atomic theory. And the summary of atomic theory can be given by these few points here. Now, I only include these because when I, was, when I was sort of reading up about this, I was surprised at how many of them could equally well be applied to, to modern particles. So, um, you know, things are made of extremely small particles. Okay, he calls them atoms, we call them other things. Um, and the next point is really important that um, particles of, of the same type are identical. And that's really important quantum mechanically and in lots of ways, but they're absolutely identical. So he says that they have this, this, the, um, the size, mass, and other properties. If you replace that by, by quantum numbers, then it would be um, very much how we view fundamental particles today. Fundamental particles cannot be divided, etc. And okay, chemical reactions are really too low energy. But if you think about the particle physics interactions that we deal with, then uh, again, these, these are things combining and separating. And, and the interaction. So there are lots of similarities. That's the only reason, really, I brought these up. So the other thing that happened in the 19th century uh, by, by all these people and lots of others was we developed a complete understanding. So we, human beings, developed a complete understanding of um, classical electromagnetism. They, through doing experiments and building up laws, they were able to, um, to understand 
how the forces in the fields interacted. They knew how things bent in magnetic fields. They, they knew how to generate current. They, they, they got as far as understanding light as being an electromagnetic wave by the 1870s, I think it was. So this complete understanding of classical physics, of classical electromagnetism, was, was built in that century. And this is really important when we come to think about what we, have, what we think about how we view forces today. So around about the 1890s, people were beginning to say that you know, our physical understanding of the universe was pretty much complete. They may be a bit premature, um, I think it's fair to say. So um, around about sort of 1897, the, the first sort of particle physics accelerator, if you like, very, very crudely, but, um, was, was being used all over the place. So this chap, uh, William Crookes, about 1870, he was able to evacuate um, chambers to about one millionth of an atmosphere in pressure. And if you do that, and if you, if you set up a system where you have um, a cathode so, and an anode, so you, ha you have a negatively charged cathode and a positively charged anode, and you put somewhere between 5 and 100 kilovolts, so they really could generate those, those, those voltages um, at the end of the 19th century. And then what you have at these, these um, pressures is you have what we would now call the electrons being stripped off the, the atoms, and the electrons are accelerated past the anode. You can see there's, there's a slit in the anode there, I hope, and they go through there, and once they're past the, the Earth, then they're shielded from the anode so they don't come back, so they, they just go forward. So you get a beam of, of particles going through there. Now, at the time, they didn't know they were particles. So what they did was they tried doing things like putting a, um, an electrostatic potential across the, the path of, of this beam, and they found it moved. And they also found that if they put um, a magnetic field going the other direction, sorry, a magnetic field going perpendicular to it, then the beam would move back. And so by combinations of magnetic and uh, uh, electrostatic fields, um, J.J. Thompson, this gentleman here, was able to work out the charge to mass ratio of of, of these particles going through, and he was able to say that they were, they were about one eighteen hundredth um, the mass of the lightest atom. So that meant, fundamentally, that the atom was not the basic unit. It meant that there was something more basic or something smaller than, than the atom. So this, this was the first discovery of what we view as a fundamental subatomic particle, what we now call the electron. Okay, around about the same time, um, the people were, were looking at, uh, at radioactivity, and they, and in 1896, uh, Becquerel, um, who was trying, trying to investigate X-rays because um, they'd been found the year before that, and again using a Crookes tube, but he was trying to he, he was trying to look at X-rays, and he ended up finding radioactivity. And very quickly, with a very primitive apparatus, um, he and, and the Curies and a few others were able by by putting radioactive sources, radioactive elements, um, in a collimated setup like this, and having a magnetic field in this area and just a photographic plate there, they were able to see that um, some, some radioactivity um, was, was, was positively charged, some was negatively charged, and some was neutral. And so, again, they, and it, they happened to call them alpha, beta, and gamma uh, in, order their, in order of their penetration power, but it showed there was something more going on than, than, just, than just atomic physics. Okay, so those are things that are happening around about the turn of the century. <coughs> Jumping ahead over the next 30 years, the the um, <coughs> the the <coughs> excuse me the picture of the atom that you're all taught at school came about where you've got a nucleus um, and you've got electrons orbiting it. Now, I'm slightly slightly nervous about showing showing this this diagram here or, or this this figure here because when I was an undergraduate here, a chap called Tom Kibble was head of the department, and, and Tom um, specified that the, the model of electrons going round on bits of wire around an atom should not be taught in this department. So this is illustrative. I'm not teaching you. Right? <laughs> this is illustrative. Um, so the other thing to point out, e even at the early part of the 20th century, some of the, some of the ideas and techniques and some of the, uh, some, some of the sort of ideas by detectors um, and probing particles with, with other particles, they, they were already in, in use. And the essence of these we can still see today. 
Okay, so looking at forces. So um, by this stage, it was understood that there were four forces. So we'll start, we'll start with gravity, the one we've been known for longest, only attractive, um, if, you know, affects everything with mass. It's, it's a long range, infinite range force, and too weak to be studied in particle physics. So that's the last you'll hear about gravity tonight. Um, electromagnetism can attract or repel, um, affects everything with an electrical charge. It's a long range, again, infinite, infinite range. Um, and you'll hear some more about that. Um, th but, but by then, they'd also got these two forces, the strong nuclear force that holds together the particles in the nucleus um, and th against the, the repulsion of the electromagnetic force. This is a short-range force. It doesn't exert its, um, its, 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 its force over, over, a long, over a long distance. And then there was the weak nuclear force, which has become which was really very important in the 20th century. And this was responsible for beta decays. And this was a very short-range force. OK, so the other thing that was going on, as well as all these wonderful experiments, um, some theorists were doing stuff. And any theorists in the audience? Not that I admit to it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and uh, so, so clearly, the, the, the big revolution that was happening, happening on the theoretical side um, in the early part of the 20th century was the invention of quantum mechanics um, uh, and, the, uh, and, and the theoretical framework that, that came with it. This, this is a hugely interesting development. And if, if, I, if I had time, I could, I could talk, I could give another lecture on that. But we, that's not what we're about tonight. The interesting thing here is when you combine um, quantum mechanics with special relativity, especially as done by Paul Dirac, and with, with the Dirac equation, you can come up with solutions which have negative energies. And these were interpreted as being, as being antiparticles. And the first, so th this is the first published, um, I'm just about to see the dot, uh, okay, so I'm just about to see it. So th this is the first published um, event of, with, with an antiparticle. And so th this, this is a Clyde chamber, which is a way of detecting charged particles. And you can see that, that and th this is a lead plate in the middle. And you can see this particle is coming up this way, going through here, and it's being bent in a magnetic field. And the reason we know it's going this way is because it has less energy here, so it's lost some energy in the lead. So we, we know from that, we know which way it's going, therefore we know the charge on the particle. And this was the discovery of the, of the positron by Anderson and, and, and Patrick Blackett. And as this is the Blackett building, I thought it probably probably mention it. Um, and they both got a Nobel Prize for it. Very good. Okay. So then, you know, okay, so they started discovering particles, and then, then, then lots of them started appearing. So in, in, back in the, in the early 1930s, 1931, um, Wolfgang Pauli um, hypothesized from the energy spectrum of, of beta decays that there must be another particle in there that's not being detected. And this was eventually called um, the neutrino. Now, th these particles must be electrically neut neutral because we weren't seeing them. Um, they didn't feel a strong force, or else we'd, we'd observe them other ways. So they only felt the weak force. This means that they're very hard to detect, and, and at low energies at least will pass through the Earth uh, with only a small probability of interaction. In the mid-1930s, the muon was, was discovered. Okay, it's electrically charged. Um, and, and so, so it could be detected, but it was, it was re relatively early shown that it didn't feel the strong force, and it turned out to be a heavy electron. Um, and in fact, it decays into an into electron through, through the weak force. Um, then in 1947, the pion was found to feel a strong force, and then through lots of experiments, by now dealing with, with colliders, um, you know, first a few and then a few tens of particles um, were found that did interact with the strong force. And these we call hadrons generically. And it interacts with the strong force we call a hadron. Um, and people were asking questions as to whether or not these could be fundamental particles. So then um, a chap called uh, Murray Gell-Mann started seeing patterns in, in these, these. So these are the various particles that were being found. So th these, were, these were different different particles, and he noticed, he noticed patterns in their properties and things like this. And he came up with the, the, the quark theory of, of matter. And at the time, there were only three quarks. There, there was up, down, and strange. And he also hypothesized that in order to have the structure they, they do have, they must have another charge of some form, and he called this color charge. So the subject he came up with, so, so the, the, the topic, the, the, the theory was called quantum, quantum chromodynamics. 
as a color. So in this, you had a proton that was made of two up quarks and a down quark, and you had a neutron that was two downs and up quark. Okay, so moving on a bit again, because we've done, done the basics, you know, we, 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 we found a few more um, quarks, and um, we've, we've found um, a, a few more leptons. But, so, we, we, so we have this pattern of the matter particles um, in our understanding of, of the universe. Um, these are what we believe to be currently um, all the fundamental particles. These are the fundamental particles in a standard model. Each of them has an antiparticle with opposite quantum numbers, um, and they all have half integer spin. So that makes them fermions. We call things with half integer spin, or multiples of half integer spin, fermions. Um, and this is important when you're considering their properties. So that's th those are the matter particles. OK, just going through them. The, um, these are all the quarks we found. They feel the strong force, the weak force, and the, and the electromagnetic force because they're, they're charged in all three of those. They have a color. And these, so this, these are, are the colors, uh, the color charges that uh, Gellman invented, and they're red, green, and blue. They cannot exist by themselves. So they must be bound into hadrons. You, you cannot have um, isolated quarks. And overall, their net color charge must be zero. So you can have, say, a proton, which has got this really is weak, okay, which, which has um, a, a, a red, blue, and a green, and, or you can have a, um, a pion, for example, which has um, a blue and an anti-blue, so a particle and an antiparticle. Okay, so the leptons, we eventually found the different sorts of neutrinos, and that each of them had a charged partner, so the muon has, has the, the muon neutrino, and we eventually found the tau and the tau neutrino, and um, Again, these feel the weak force. They don't feel the strong force. Um, and if they're, if they're electrically charged, they feel the electromagnetic force. OK, so this is a bit, 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 this is a bit of cataloging. The fact that these can be grouped into three families um, has important impl implications and is very interesting in its own right. But I don't have time to go into that tonight. OK, so then I'm going to talk a little bit about symmetries. So a symmetry exists if an object is invariant under, under any, any form of transformation. So you can see here, there's a fairly obvious example. If you imagine that these weren't labeled, um, you could see there'd be a lot more symmetries. And let me just give examples here. Um, this is just something I picked up off the web to give you an example of this. But clearly, these are all discrete symmetries. You have to perform a complete operation to, 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 um, see, to, to see the symmetry. But clearly, you can have, you can have continuous um, symmetries as well. All you have to do is think of them as being a circle, and you can think of lots of ways you can rotate a circle, or you can, or you can flip it, or lots of things you can do. Okay, so symmetries are really important in, in our understanding of, of the universe for lots of reasons, not least of which is, is, is Neudel's theorem, which is 1915, that says that for every symmetry there's a conserved quantity. And this is really important, and it's, it's very much used in quantum field theory, but it's also, you can also use it in classical in classical physics, for example, the basic reason that you have the laws of physics being, being invariant on the temporal transformation, i.e. they're the same today as they, as they were yesterday, um, um, is, is the reason that you have conservation of energy. Um, and and so, so this symmetry brings out a conserved property. So Noda theorem is, is one of the cornerstones of modern theoretical physics. Um, it's also interesting that she's only the second woman who's appeared in any of my pictures. Um, and she, she had lots of discrimination during the day and found it very hard to get, to get a job, um, even to the extent that um, I, I believe um, a famous mathematician, um, David Hilbert, when, when she was finding it hard to be recruited to a faculty of which he was part, you know, famously said, uh, we're running a university, not, not a bathing club. Um, and eventually she did, she did um, get a job. OK, so rattling through these a bit. So forces and gauge theories. So th this, this, is, this is really where the, the story that involves the Higgs um, really starts. So I could, have, I could have started here. I would have saved you a good 10 minutes. Um, um, so since the late 1920s, theoretical physicists had really been trying to apply quantum mechanics to the fields 
of the forces as well as to the motion of the particles themselves. So th there were lots of steps in, 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 in this road, and they're all very interesting. But really, it was successfully done um, around about 1950 by Feynman, uh, Swinger, and, and uh, Tobinaga, the, these three gentlemen here. And what, so the way the gauge theory works is you look for physical symmetry and you force it to be true um, everywhere. So it's, it's what's called local gauge invariance. So it's, it's not just true of the whole system, it's, it's true at every point in space. And by doing that, um, it naturally um, introduces an interaction between the matter particle and a force, um, a force carrying particle, if you like. So f for electromagnetism, this force carrying particle is the photon. And so a very simple, actually it's not that simple, but, but an example of that would be something like this, where you have electron scattering and you have two electrons. So you have, imagine time going that way, space going that way, and the exchange of photon. And so it, by, by the exchange of this photon, they, 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 they feel the presence of the other uh, electromagnetically. So that's, that was all well and good, and that was very well understood. And those three gentlemen rightly got a Nobel Prize for it, and it's an extraordinarily well-tested theory. So um, then people started to look at the weak force. Now, the weak force is very interesting in many ways. I, I could spend a whole lecture talking about the weak force and how it works um, and the handedness of it and things like this. But, you know, just keep things to basics. Um, but the problem is that because the weak force is such a short range, we know that force-carrying particles must have a very large mass. And so, um, so people started in 1954 and trying to do this, uh, but any attempt they, they had to, to try and um, bring, bring these, to try and develop um, a gauge theory of the weak force had problems because any time they introduced mass into it, it broke the symmetry. So in 1960, um, a chap called Sheldon Lee Glashow um, tried to show, one, he had to go one step further. He tried to show that the weak nuclear force and the electromagnetic force could, could in some way be combined and could somehow, somehow mix with each other and, and could be really part of the same force. And he says, I think the, amongst the first lines of the paper um, are along the lines of, well, I know this can't be true because, because of the mass problem, but let's ignore that for now. Um, and, and, he's, and he makes some headway um, doing that. But fundamentally, everybody knew this mass was a problem. So then, in, uh, in 1964, three independent groups came up with the same idea uh, pretty much independently. So I put them in this order because this is technically the order that they published in, but they were, they were all, all independent. So there was, there was um, well, you can see the names, Robert Englert, uh, Peter Higgs, um, and then three gentlemen who, who were at Imperial College at, at, at that time and were... Uh, and we're really central to this, this development as it happens. Um, so, yeah, it was a really interesting period, and lo lots of fascinating work was done. And they, so th what they came up with was they hypothesized the existence of a universal field that, that ex exists you know, th throughout space. And it's through interacting with this field that the, the particles can acquire mass. But in order to do this, the, the potential for this field has to be a really odd shape. Normally, you expect the potential to come to minimize um, at, at the zero, at, right in the middle there. Um, so you, you, you'd expect um, the, the sort of the, the minimal energy, energy point to be to be right at zero. But if you have a field of this shape, sort of Mexican hat, or, or I prefer to call it wine bottle um, potential, um, then of course the minimum isn't there. It can be somewhere around around this ring here. And so people had, had thought about this already to some extent, and they thought if you did this, you, you would generate lots and lots of massless particles. And what, what Higgs and co. did was they were able to show that if you do this, in fact, you can, you can transform things so these, these particles disappear, and, but you're left with one, one extra particle on, on top of all the particles you've got, and this is called the Higgs boson. So th three, years, three years after that, in 1967, Weinberg and Salam were able to use the Higgs mechanism to, to unify the electromagnetic and the weak force, um, which is um, what Glashow had been trying to do um, seven years earlier. And in doing so, by, by using the Higgs mechanism, they were able to correctly 
assign the masses to the weak force carriers, the W plus and minus and the Zs, whilst keeping the photon massless. And this was a fantastic piece of work. And so Salam was, was, again was here at the time. Um, and you know, so the, the, the activities of the theory group here were absolutely central to all of this. I believe, I believe Stephen Weinberg had spent a year here um, in the run-up to this. Uh, I only know that's because he gave a talk here a couple of years ago, and he said so. <laughs> so and I believe him. <laughs> um, so it turns out, okay, so th th this work was ostensibly done to give the force carriers the mass, and it turns out if you go through it, then it also allows all those, all those matter particles, all those fermions that I mentioned earlier, it, it, it allows them to to um, acquire mass. And so it's a very, it has a very important role in that as well. OK. So with the addition of the gluon as the, the addition of the gluon as the, as the force carrier for the, um, the strong nuclear force, we, we, we've now built up, and with this Higgs boson here, we've now built up a complete set of what we view as called standard model. So these are the force carriers. Um, these are the matter, matter particles, and that, that, that's the Higgs boson that allows spontaneous symmetry breaking. So without the Higgs, this could not be complete. So, so this is the first thing it's good for, right? I told you there's going to be some things. And this is, well, there's one other his historical one, and the rest of them will be, will be current, I promise you. Um, so it allows particles to have mass. It, it, it allows particles to acquire mass. And so without this, we wouldn't have the standard model. So it's good for one thing at least, right? OK, something that didn't occur to me until I was writing this talk, but it's also the most political particle. Now, I've never known particles be political before, but this really was. So Margaret Thatcher, not everybody's favorite cup of tea. Um, but according to David Willits, um, who was working in a think tank for her at the time, she overruled um, a skeptical cabinet review on the UK's involvement in, in the Large Hadron Collider um, with a simple comment but of, yes, but isn't interesting. And according to David Willits, um, it's not clear um, that the UK would have had any significant involvement in the LHC if she hadn't done that. So that was in the 80s. <coughs> Moving to 1993, William Waldegrave, a man with a history degree, and therefore eminently qualified to be science minister, <laughs> um, observed... Um, that taxpayers were paying a lot of money to try to find the Higgs through the CERN subscription, and very few of them had any idea what it meant. So he offered a prize of a good bottle of champagne um, for, the, for the best explanation of, of what, a, what the Higgs boson was and why he wanted to find it on one side of A4. So I believe he gave it out to five people, um, to, to, so for, to five groups, um, one of which was, was, was Tom Kibble again, um, and the other was Marion in Butterworth, who were also here, um, and I've got a picture of Ian Butterworth, but I couldn't find a picture of Mary. Um, I did try, but uh, wasn't able to do so. And also, this appeared to work. So this history graduate, apparently in September 1993, whilst visiting the University of Kiel, was asked by a journalist, what is the Higgs boson? And the answer he gave was, the Higgs field is an all-permeating all field which other particles pass through and acquire mass. I'm beginning to see why it's important. <laughs> so... So, you know, sometimes these ministers can learn stuff. The other thing is, um, you know, when we found it, I've never known anything like the, the excitement over any other bit of particle physics in the <clears throat> years I've been doing it. You know, when we, when we found the, the top quark of things like this, no, one, it wasn't the front page of newspapers, it was interesting, but it, it wasn't, wasn't the front page at all. So people are genuinely interested in this. Um, and th these are just UK papers. Um, you know, all around the world, there the, were the front page news um, for, for, the, for this discovery. So the second thing it's really useful for is engaging with the kind taxpayers <laughs> who fund us all and, um, and the, the ministers who make the, the, the decisions with, with, research, with, with research in the fundamental physics. So these two things it's good for. Okay. So now we get a bit more up to date, and we're we going to the Large Hadron Collider. And in 19, sorry, in 2012, um, the the Higgs was discovered by Atlas and another experiment called uh, sorry by CMS. I got the wrong way around. by CMS and another experiment called Atlas. I got it completely the wrong way around. Um, <laughs> fine. So 
I'll concentrate on the CMS side. So um, what did it take to find the Higgs? So R Rolf Hoyer, who was the DG at the time, said it took three things. It took um, the machine, which is what we call the accelerator. It took the detectors, by which he was talking about CMS on the other one, um, and the worldwide compu well, actually the computing grid. So the, the machine, the, the detector, again, if I had more time, I'd speak a, a, a great deal about it. It is one of the most awesome pieces of engineering ever constructed by, by, by human beings. You know, it's, tw it's, a, it's a long way underground, a 27-kilometer tunnel. It has superconducting magnets that, that have currents of around 10,000 amps going through them. And in order to keep superconducting, they are, they're, they're, they're chilled to temperatures that are colder than out of space. They're able to bring large bunches of protons together 40, in collisions 40 million times a second at the center of CMS and Atlas. Their designs were in a center of mass energy of, of 14 TeV. Um, I, I shall start to, okay, I'll explain to you later. And I could go on and go on. The people who built this, I don't know if any of you know anything about superfluid helium. It's, it's, a, has, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, a, a liquid that has really strange properties. Um, and that, that are almost unfathomable. These people do engineering with it, and with, with tons and tons of it. So it is one of the most incredible engineering feats I, I can ever imagine. But moving on. Um, so this is an expanded view of the CMS detector. And the, there's no, I don't would have time to go through it in any detail, but the important thing, the, the thing I want to try and point out, okay, first the, the scale, right? That's a human being. Um, and this is the CMS detector pulled apart. But the thing I want to get across to you is that there's these different layers of detector. Now, these different layers of detector all have different purposes. And I'll show you on the next slide um, very briefly what, what they do um, and how they allow you to, to, to distinguish between different particles. Um, and we will, we will need to use those a little bit later. OK, and this is what it looks like on the ground. So th this is what one of the end caps out, and you can see a human being there. This is all, this is all precision engineering. Uh, for, for those of you who have been lucky enough to see the, the CMS detector or the Atlas detector, they, they are marvelous pieces of engineering. And um, OK, the, the, this department has had a significant role in, in at least two of the, the, the sub-detectors of, 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 of CMS. So in the inner part, you've got a tracking detector that will track charged particles. So you can see charged particles going through there. Um, then you've got what's called an electromagnetic calorimeter, and that will interact. That, that has interactions with um, um, electrons and photons, uh, uh, effectively. So um, other particles have some minor interaction but pass through. So if this is an electron, you can see it's charged. It leaves a track there, and it deposits its energy in the electromagnetic calorimeter. This, is, this, is, this dashed line is a photon, so it leaves no track, but it does leave the deposit in the electric calorimeter. Then you have a neutral, so then outside that you have um, a hadron calorimeter, which, um, which um, hadrons interact with, so you have charged hadrons that interact with it, so you have a track and an energy deposit, and you have neutral ones that, that don't and an energy deposit, and then you have muons that will pass all the way through that, through the magnet, and have muon detectors on the outside. So that was very rushed, but the, the thing I want you to get across here, the thing I want you to understand here is that um, the design of the detector is such that we can distinguish between these different sorts of particles, and that's really important, because that, that, that ability to distinguish between particles is what enables us to do the particle physics that, that we're doing. So this is what a typical um, interaction looks like. So, this, this is an event display. These blocks are energy deposited in the calorimeter, and all these tracks are charged tracks. The majority of, of which, sorry, yeah, these are charged tracks, the majority of which are hadrons. And you can see a jet like structure here. That's from the interactions and the hadronization of, of the quarks. Now, this happens to be a candidate for a um, Higgs, goes to two Zs, goes to two electrons, goes to two muons. I've chosen this one so, because we've got muons in there as well. So you can see here we've got these are muon detectors. Um, firing there, and similarly over there, and these are two electrons um, here and here. So you can see that all parts of the detector are being used there. Okay, so the Higgs production at the LHC. There are essentially four, four major ways where the, 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 the Higgs is produced. Now the ratio of which 
um, of the order which they're, they're done is shown in this plot here. Um, so um, this process where you've got um, two gluons f um, combining in a fermionic loop, um, producing a Higgs, this is dominated by, by the top quark, um, is, is this one here. Um, and the next most important one is this one, where you've got two vector bosons, these are Ws or Zs, producing a, a Higgs, is this one here. And you see there's about a ratio, about a factor of 10. However, this one has topological properties which make it easier to, to find. In fact, they, they, they all do. And again, there's about another factor of 10 down to this, this diagram. Uh, but again, here, you've, you've got another particle that you can look for. So basically, the, what I'm trying to tell you here is that just because something is the most is the most common way of doing it. Other approaches can have uh, benefits because they can be cleaner and because they have topological signatures that you can use to, to, to then fi find the Higgs. And that'll become important in one of the last th things we, we talk about. Okay, so we, we didn't know where, where the Higgs was, but now we do. And so we can, you know, this, this is roughly the, the mass of the Higgs that we found. Again, when we started studying the Higgs, um, we didn't know what the mass was, um, and so we had to decide what channels to look in. So um, the Imperial College group was, was, working in, was already working in Higgs to Gamma Gamma when, when I joined, which is a very interesting um, area. I decided to, to work in the Higgs to Tau area here, and the reason, for example, I didn't look in the, in the Higgs to BB bar, which is where most of them are going, is because this channel is completely swamped. So you need to buy, buy other backgrounds. So you need to, it's a balance between looking for something that happens a lot and something that is clean enough to, to be able to, to be seen. And we'll, 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 see, we'll see that later. It turns out that the Higgs to Gamma Gamma and the Higgs to ZZ were the, the, the dominant discovery channels. Um, but if the mass had been different, it, it, it might have been different, and there are, there are other reasons for go, using the tower as well. But it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off between, uh, between backgrounds and being able to see your signal. So the Higgs was, was found there, and you can see the gamma gamma is, is near its maximum there, um, and it, it, it's, it's high ZZ as well. But you know, these, are, these are all um, interesting ways of studying it. So we, we use towers. Uh, so I'd better put in what the tau decay looks like here. So if you have a tau coming along here, say a tau minus, it radiates a W minus, um, and be it becomes a, a tau neutrino. So this W minus then um, becomes two fermions. Now those fermions can be um, leptons, so they can be muons or electrons, or they can be quarks, and if they're quarks, then, then they, 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 these, these form a, form a jet. It can be a jet of particles going out because quarks can't be by themselves. Okay, that's about as technical as I want to get. So, the, the discovery. A set is discovered in Higgs to Gamma Gamma and Higgs to ZZ, and these are the, the discovery plots. And you can see that there's a small bump here, just enough to be convincing. And you can see that over, over, over here, you, you have this, this bump here at 125 GV, which is greatly helped by having the line there. But if you add them up and you go through it, then you find that this, this does amount to a discovery. So, did we see it in Higgs to Tau? Uh, well, not really. Um, so, this is what we saw in the Taus, and we didn't see any excess. And if you look at these different plots here, th th these, this is, okay, we're going to tell you what this is, but th this is a summation of all the probabilities, and you can see they just dips below this five sigma, and the Higgs to Tau one is this line at the top here. However, that was not what we, we well, that's exactly what we expected to see. So we weren't disappointed, really. Um, um, if, it, if we had seen anything, it would have not been a standard model Higgs, certainly, and it may or may not be a standard model Higgs, but it, it wouldn't have been like standard model Higgs at all. So that was kind of what we expected. And eventually, eventually, so in 2017, we, we did see it with some, with some around two data, and th these two, these are two just um, mass plots, and so the big background we've got is this, is the Z decay to two towers, but you can see, we understand that it's well enough that we can, um, we can put, we, we can understand our backgrounds well enough that we can see we have an excess there. And these, this gray, this gray blurring here represents our uncertainty on what that background is. And these, these are just two channels, and you can see this is one where we're looking 
uh, this, this vector boson fusion channel, which is where you have two Ws, um, and you get, you get many, you get far fewer events, but they're very clean. And here you have more events, many more events, but the backgrounds are bigger. But if you combine the two together, you can find that you, you find that you do actually have enough to claim observation of the Higgs decaying to um, to two towers. Now this was important uh, for many reasons. The most the most directly important, the most direct reason was it was the first direct measurement of the Higgs coupling to, to fermions. Um, and so we were, we, were, we were able to understand how well the Higgs attaches to fermions um, really very, very well. And you can see, oops, let's go back. You can see that it was in line with the standard model, pretty much. Um, we didn't have much sensitivity on the uh, coupling to, to, to vector bosons. So, so th other measurements have made that. Um, so that, 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 was, that was a really very important measurement and very useful. And what's more, we, we got there about a year ahead of Atlas. Not as any competition. Um, so so the, I was actually very, uh, directly involved in this analysis as, as I led the group doing it at the time. And it was, it was, it was quite a, it was, it was a long analysis. Okay. So... To doing things like this and using the Higgs couplings to various particles and knowing that the, 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 the way that the Higgs couples to different particles depends on their mass and whether they're fermions and bosons and other things, um, where you can build up very stringent tests of the standard model. And you can see here over, um, over was it, four orders of, 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 uh, of mass range, the measurements we have of the of, of the um, couplings um, to, to the, the, the Higgs fall on what we expect as a standard model. So um, we, can, we can see that that is, you know, that, that's a pretty good test. If you can go four orders of magnitude, that is, that is, that is pretty special, pretty, pretty, pretty significant. So the third thing it's good for, <clears throat> very detailed test of the standard model. If it didn't agree with the standard model, then there'd be something wrong, the standard model would be broken. Okay, so why don't we go beyond the standard model? So we know the standard model is pretty good, but we know it's not perfect. Too many parameters, fine-tuning problem. Why is, the, why is the Higgs mass where it is? Does it provide a dark matter? It doesn't provide a dark matter candidate. Um, and we even know it's broken because we know that neutrinos have mass. There are lots of other reasons why we know the standard model isn't perfect. So what is beyond the standard model? There are many things, beyond, many models beyond the standard model. Most of them rely on some form of supersymmetry. When they turned on the LHC, everyone said we'll find supersymmetry within weeks. We're still looking. Um, and most of these models, there are generally at least five Higgs particles, two charged Higgs and three neutral Higgs with different properties. Um, in these models, the mass of the, the different Higgs bosons are not independent, and so it's traditional to, to parameterize the, the, the space in, the, in, in terms of the mass of the A particle and tangent beta, you do it in others, it's fine. So have we found anything? Well, no, not really. Um, so this is kind of the thing we're looking for, where we have uh, gluons coming in, splitting into, into two Bs. Because of the nature of supersymmetry, then th this, this is enhanced, at least for the A, and then those decaying to taus. And this, I couldn't find a definitive plot for this, so this is what I took from a conference talk given by somebody who used to be here. Um, but you can see where we were before the start of the LHC. You can see this is um, mass, of the a, mass of the A, MA, this is tangent beta. And you can see the area they've managed to exclude. Ignore the rest of this, this is from, from elsewhere. But this is the area they've managed to exclude. And this was, I think, the, the most recent one we had in 2016 data. And you can see the area that they were excluded before we started is kind of up here somewhere. So we've managed to exclude all the space, and eventually if you close the space down, then it shows that at least that form of supersymmetry isn't, isn't physically there. Don't forget, this may sound obvious now, but a couple of years ago, people, people were expecting us to find stuff here. And we haven't, we've looked and have not found it. So these plots, these plots should not be viewed as being directly comparable because they're not, they're different models, but they're indicative of the progress we've made in these sort of, of searches. Okay, well, another thing you can do is you can look for um, CP violation. Now, CP violation is important. We live in a matter-dominated universe, um, and yet we believe matter and antimatter were produced equally at the Big Bang. Therefore, there must be a broken symmetry. 
This symmetry is what we call charge parity or CP. So the reason we have a dominant universe is, is somewhere there must be CP violation. So we've found CP violation in quarks and probably in neutrinos. And we're still looking for it in the Higgs, in the Higgs sector. And we'll, we will see what we see. Um, but the Higgs that came to Taos are a particularly powerful environment for doing this. And again, I could talk about this all night, but won't, because uh, the drinks are outside. Um, <laughs> and, um, and we are working, this is something we are working on very, very strongly at the moment. And I, I saw so some of my postdoc and uh, students coming in earlier. And this is something we're working on. I had hoped to give you some results tonight. However, not yet. <laughs> um, hopefully by March next year. Okay. One last thing beyond the standard model I'll cover. Um, so we can use the Higgs decays to look for dark matter. If dark matter, it, um, which we believe exists, is made of particles, and they acquire mass the same way as normal particles do, then um, they must copter the Higgs. If they're less than half the mass of the Higgs, um, the Higgs will decay to them. But by the very nature, dark matter particles don't interact with stuff, or else we'd see them, and they wouldn't be dark. So we're, we're looking for an absence of something. So very quickly, you know, if you think about what's a proton collision, you have a proton, this, there's two ups and a down. But it isn't really. It's actually loads and loads of, of quarks and gluons interacting and coming out of existence all the time. It's a big stew of stuff going on. So when you collide them, you, you, they may, the protons may have um, equal momentum in the, in, the, in the direction, but the parts that interact are not the whole protons. The parts that interact are some fraction of what's inside the proton. And so we don't know what fraction of the energy is being carried by the part that interacts. And so, for example, here, in, in this way, you've got all, all, these, all these parts going forwards. Um, it just means that the, 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 the part of this proton, the interaction with the part of that proton, had more momentum going that way than the part of this proton interacting with that one. So that's fine. Um, and because the energies of these are very large, then you can expect this. However, if you see something like this, where, where you've got everything coming down one side, we know that whilst they have a lot of momentum going into each other, they have very little momentum sideways, we can, you can infer there's a missing particle there. And so, so you can infer that there's something you haven't seen that's gone off that way, and it's something significant. So that's what we do. So... Um, what we've been doing at, at Imperial is we've been using this, this production mechanism. So this has a particular topology that we can recognize without uh, you. We can say there's likely to be a Higgs form there. And by looking for missing transverse energy or missing transverse momentum, we are able to produce dark matter searches. I don't know if you can see this. The details aren't, aren't that important. But the important thing here is at uh, the time when this plot was produced, this was the best direct dark matter search. And these were, the, these were our indirect dark matter searches. And so, so it's a complementary technique to using direct dark matter searches. Again, there are lots of other things that could be, um, that, that, that we could use Higgs for. But I've, 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 you know, I've more than out of time. So I'll very quickly, so there are many things that Higgs is good for. Um, many, many. Um, for, for, for looking for new particles. And exploring the universe beyond the standard model. Okay, very, I'm going to very quickly cover some of the computing stuff that I've been involved with. So each LHC experiment produces tens of petabytes of data a year um, and a similar amount of Monte Carlo. Some of the data is hot, meaning lots of people want to analyze it, which means you need multiple copies of it. And some is cool, meaning only a few people want to analyze it. And there are, and which is hot and which is cool changes over time. So it was realized in about the year 2000 that we needed a solution to this. And we came up with the Worldwide LHC Computing Grid, or WLCG. So this is what it is now. It's about 170 sites around the world in 42 countries. It is about a million, 1.2 million was the last time I looked, um, CPU cores. It's just over an exabyte of data, and it runs a few million jobs a day. And everything's connected by links of 10 to 100 gigabits. So this is something that was pointed out to me by Dave Britton that it's, it's an astonishing achievement. More than even the infrastructure, the fact that all these people trust each other is significant. So for th those, those people who use computing acronyms as something as a service, this is trust as a service. 
Okay, just to put a context on the massive data move, this was a slide I, 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 I produced a year ago, but you can see this just for CMS. So this is the accumulated amount of data moved uh, in a year. And so we've used tens of petabytes a year. You know, over over the, the year, that's about, we moved sort of about 300 petabytes because of moving things to the right place. And you can see that maybe one of the uh, what, 15th site uh, is important is, is us. And we do this over a network that's this complicated. Uh, there's the UK. Um, and um, I don't know if, they, if our networking people are here today. They, they were stuck down here. Um, so, uh, uh, Matthew, great. So, um, we, we've, we were the first institution in the UK to have a 100 gigabit connection. And you can see we're, we're using it. This was a, a week or so ago. And you can see that we have, um, we have traffic coming in and going out. Um, peaking uh, pretty much near, near the 100, 100 gigabits and doing that for sustained time. And it's, it's, through, it's through our ability to have these sort of connections, to move these data around, we can do the science that we want to do. Okay, in the UK, we have a Group of P project, which is organized into regions like this. Um, and um, this is about 10% of WLCG. And over the last you know, 24 years, about, um, was it 135 million funding over 24 years? So it has been well funded by those very nice taxpayers we've been talking about. And just adding to this, we no longer do just the LCG experiments. We have this long tail of other experiments that we provide resources for. And recently, there's a new project being formed. It's not really a project. It's, it's, a, it's a community, um, a, a, well, a mutually consenting coordination body called IRIS, and then here we're bringing in, um, we're, we're, we're collaborating with people outside the particle physics field. So this is, this is really very interesting, and this is very much what we believe the, the future of scientific computing is likely to be. Okay, so something else I think is good for is inspiring technical solutions to problems we can merge with other areas. So I'm pretty much getting to the end. One last thing that, that uh, Higgs physics is good for Okay, it's inspiring strangely nautical jokes at the expense of particle physics. So in 2012, 2013, the number of things like, like this that I saw, I don't know if people can read that. It's not that funny. <laughs> Certainly for a particle physicist. Okay, so that's really the end of, the end of my talk. So just a quick word about teamwork. I've been very lucky in the years that I've been doing this to be working in some very good teams. And so the, the people on level five, um, Louise especially, um, uh, went, went through some of, the, some of the people I've worked with. And so there's some pictures here of people who either have been or largely in my team, but some extra ones that Louise thought needed scanning. So a picture of Paula, some of you know. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll flick through these. these. These are only representative of some of the, of the people that I've, uh, I've worked with over the years. Um, they're mostly my team. But, um, so you can see all, 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 these, all these people are... Uh, you know, very good people. So th this, this is an in-joke. We'll come back to that later. Um, and Peter, you'll see later. Fine. Of course, the most important team of all are my family, who are always very supportive and never seem to complain too much when we're on holiday somewhere in the UK and I just nip into the university to have a chat with somebody. Um, so fine. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for listening. Agreed, and there is time for perhaps one or two questions. If anyone had any burning questions, okay. one just behind you over there. Hi, very nice talk. Um, I was just wondering if you thought uh, is, is there data already been taken that could exclude supersymmetry, or is it requiring? Uh... Um, you can never properly exclude supersymmetry. <laughs> um, it's almost unkillable, almost. Um, a killable. Um, but um, I think the theorist called John Ellis um, said it, it may not be dead, but it seems to be useful if you don't find something um, in uh, the TEV mass range. Um, and so whilst we've taken quite a lot of data, we, we can probe some of that area, um, we will need to take more data to, 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 to you know, there's, there's more to do, but it's, it's, it's not looking very well theory, shall we say.
Yeah, down at the front here, please. Would quantum computing be of any help to write petabytes of data? Um, that's something we're looking at, actually. This, this is... Uh, um, so, the, the, UK, the UK has recently published um, a roadmap on, on, the, on the computing models that, that they're looking for, and it's thought that quantum computing is likely to be more useful for, for the um, classically um, close couple simulations, um, but it, it is still some, it is something that is being investigated, and the UK does plan to invest um, heavily in, 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 in quantum computing. This was... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know quite what to say about that. <laughs> Sorry, I mm. have to repeat myself. Is quantum computing any help for grinding to petabytes of data? Do I have to answer it again, please? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> just, just for the, just yeah, for the just, yeah. just for link. Okay, we'll, uh, there will be refreshments afterwards. We'll have a chance to chat. But can I now invite uh, Professor Peter Donald to give the vote of thanks? Thanks, Kenny. Well, it's my great pleasure to. Uh, offer this vote of thanks to David for this excellent, illuminating lecture. To get from the Cook's Tube to the LHC in 40 minutes is quite something, <laughs> certainly. <coughs> My first duty is actually to remind you that uh, immediately afterwards uh, there is a uh, drinks reception in the foyer outside, so I shan't go on for too long. Um, I first met David in 1988 when he was a member of one of my second year tutorial groups. Even then, I think we knew he was going to be special. But it wasn't too clear which direction that speciality would take, uh, certainly. Frequently in the tutorials, he would come up with very insightful observations about some of the physics. Other times, he would appear to be disinterested. And I later found out that David, as always, has had many, many interests in his uh, activities. And the physics at that time was just one of them, certainly. <coughs> we then lost touch while he did his third year, but I was extremely pleased when I heard he wanted to do um, a PhD with the high energy group, and particularly pleased when he joined me on the Aleph experiment at CERN for his PhD. As a student, again, his independence and free spirit was in evidence everywhere. I mean, he has a very an <coughs> interesting approach. He likes to follow his own ideas, certainly. And this is something to be really applauded. Uh, we need people like this who will really push their own ideas. As a supervisor, it can be a bit frustrating, but uh, still, it is something that we treasure, certainly. <coughs> Later, after his PhD, um, we go to the middle of the 90s, and David was just coming to the end of his first postdoc period. At that period, um, there was a lot of discussion about the grid. Now, I was head of the group at the time and didn't really know what this grid computing really was at all. And so I say, David was, um, within Aleph, David had begun to learn a lot about the computing for these big experiments and appreciated the importance of it uh, in everything. So I talked to David and said, well, you're coming to the end of your uh, contract, and, but I can give you six months if you find out what the grid is all about, find out whether we should be involved, and if so, uh, what we do, or is it just a fad that will go away in a, few, in a short time? And I remember adding that, you know, basically, if it's good and you can get involved, we get a big grant, you'll get a longer extension for your contract. <laughs> well... <coughs> As they say, the rest is history. David got, appreciated the full merits of the grid, got heavily involved, became one of the UK leaders, a position he maintains today, and he did obtain a very a substantial grant uh, for this activity. So he did continue with us for the next and the next and the next years, and he's still with us, certainly. He built up a great team, as he's mentioned uh, before, and Imperial now is one of the major groups for grid activities. And now we're moving on to the cloud uh, in the UK, certainly. At the turn of the century, David then moved to CMS, and he began the hunt for the Higgs boson. 
The Higgs, it is very hard. I mean, David's done a great job, actually. But for many people outside particle physics, it's difficult to appreciate the colossal importance of the Higgs. First, its discovery. And secondly, as David has been saying, to understand its, part, its properties. This is just as important, actually. Um, the standard model, um, basically, Imperial has played a huge part, as, again, David has uh, referred to, in the development of the standard model. Uh, Tom Kibble was one of the people who formulated the Higgs mechanism. Abdus Salam unified electroweak and weak forces and then merged them with the Higgs to produce the standard model. Abdus got the Nobel Prize with Sheldon Glashow and uh, Steven Weinberg. And Tom, I think, just missed out. It's very sad. But the standard model is an amazing theory. It is far better than anyone expected. It was formulated around the 1970s. And everyone thought it was a nice, an interesting theory. But as we progressed with our experiments during the latter half of the 20th century, everything we did fitted beautifully in the standard model, except for one thing. The, uh, the standard model to work had to have a Higgs boson. Or it had to have a Higgs mechanism, which led to a Higgs boson. And the Higgs boson was predicted to be something like nothing that we'd ever seen before. It was a boson with spin zero. We don't have any others like this at all. So this brings us to the CMS experiment. Again, Imperial played a big role. Um, Jim Verdi with uh, Michel Delanegra from CERN was, were the uh, instigators of CMS. They built the experiment up. And it was designed specifically to look for the Higgs boson. And David joined this team. And of course, as he's told us, the Higgs was finally discovered in 2012. But it does not stop there. As David has clearly described, we must now probe its properties to decide whether or not is this the pure standard model Higgs boson, but there should be some indication there of where we go beyond the standard model to the beyond the standard model physics that we know must be there, as what David has described. <laughs> and typically, David has devoted himself to one of the most important but one of the most difficult aspects of this search for looking for the uh, uh, sort of properties of the Higgs boson. And that, as he has described, the Higgs decay to two tau uh, leptons. This is most important because it's really the only way we're going to get an accurate value of the Higgs properties in decaying to, in coupling to leptons, certainly. But it's incredibly difficult, and I don't think David really emphasized this nearly strongly enough. I mean, the tau uh, lepton lives for a very short period of time, uh, less than a trillionth of a second. It has a track which is about a few millimeters long. It then decays to particles, and some of which are neutrinos, which you never see. So really finding this has demanded a lot of these expert computing techniques which David had developed uh, in his... Uh, career. And as, you, as he told you not too long ago, the first evidence was found for the Higgs going to the tau leptons. We have to go further. We have to find much more accurate values uh, because if we're going to probe what is beyond the standard model. But it is quite amazing that this was done. And again, they've referred to the fact that the LHC and CMS are magnificent achievements. They're engineering achievements. But just as important is the fact that we now have amazing software. And David has been one of the sort of pioneers of producing how we do uh, e-science on a grand scale, such as we do for the LHC today. And we will do for many other experiments, both in particle physics, but also outside particle physics as well. And we, uh, we really appreciate your efforts in this direction. I think, David, your talk has impressed us all and the achievements you've made, and the exciting future potential we have. And so, very, very many thanks for this talk. Now we can go to the reception. <laughs> <laughs>